Thanks for coming. It's a humbling experience to be here, and more importantly, to be presented with the task of delivering the Hazlitt Memorial Lecture. Um, uh, Hazlitt has been an inspiration for my entire pro professional career, not just because his appreciation of economics was inspired by his work as a journalist, but also because of the clarity of his writing. Now, it was a different era, of course, back when he was writing for places like the New York Times, Newsweek, and The Nation. On one hand, those media enterprises were open-minded enough to actually let an editorial writer uh, write about things in a free market way that they probably would not today. On the other hand, though, he did this before uh, the intellectual support of organizations like the Mises Institute and the vast array of information and literature that the Institute and folks like you in the audience have created. Uh, that literature makes it a lot easier for journalists writing about policy to do our jobs today. Of course, that is, if we actually pay attention to critical thinking and research. But let me have the indulgence of a brief digression first. Uh, Lou asked me to talk about media leaps. Uh, he wrote the title for the speech. And at first glance, it may seem like I'm an odd person to talk about elitism. I mean, I live in downtown San Francisco, after all, which is probably what most conservatives would call elite in a very anti-Auburn, a very unflattering kind of way. <laughs> Now, I mean, San Francisco is a city that delights in thumbing its nose at not just federal law, but also state law and everything from gay marriage uh, to banning handguns. Uh, my elected representative in Congress is none other than Nancy Pelosi. My city pioneered the entirely economically sensible idea of handing out monthly cash payments to every homeless person with the entirely predictable result of luring homeless people from all over California. <laughs> and convincing at the margin gainfully employed people to pretend to be homeless and stand in line for an hour a day to collect their checks once a month. I mean, San Francisco is where we issue licenses to clubs uh, for private encounters uh, of the sort that cannot be described in family newspapers. It's where the city uh, supports an annual event called the Folsom Street Fair. I'm looking around to see if any of you have heard of this, where you can participate in uh, <laughs> where these the same, the same encounters become much more public. Um, this is Orrin Hatch's worst nightmare of liberal elitism, um, and I'm coming from it uh, to be here today. Uh, on the other hand, though, I mean, it's a beautiful area to live in. The Sierras are just 200 miles away. Uh, we have the natural splendor of Big Sur and Monterey Bay uh, to the south. Uh, that's where Carmel is. This is a town that elected Clint Eastwood mayor. Uh, Eastwood is, by the way, a self-described libertarian, so there's some hope for our area yet. Uh, we have the excellent wines of Sonoma and Napa Valleys across the Golden Gate Bridge to the north. Um, on the political front, uh, free thinking rem remains alive and well. A town just outside of San Francisco, Fremont, is home to Pete Stark, uh, who you might have heard about this week. He's the only openly atheist member of Congress, according to the American Humanist Association. And of course, the area is home to the greatest and smartest collection of <coughs> entrepreneurs the world has seen so far. Uh, we've been home to the national revolt against uh, draconian federal drug laws. Uh, Angel Raich, uh, the plaintiff uh, who went up before the Supreme Court, which uh, shamefully said, oh yes, of course, regulating uh, drugs is a reasonable use of the Commerce Clause, lives right across the bay in Oakland. And our handgun ban was struck down by the courts, although unfortunately not by the same, on the same Second Amendment grounds that the D.C. Circuit used. This is California after all. Okay, now let me return to my original topic. Uh, before I moved to California a year or so ago, I lived in Washington for over a decade. And I suspect that's why Lou invited me to speak here today. If California is a home of liberal elites, Washington is a home of media elites. And one reason why many of us here today care so much about the topic of the media uh, is that we believe that it's ho hostile to Austrian ideas and to free market views in general. Now, I haven't come across any research yet that asks and answers precisely that question. Uh, but if we rephrase it uh, along more traditional lines, uh, liberal versus conservative, there's a wealth of consistent survey data and other research. The American Society of Newspaper Editors research suggests that journalists are younger, better educated, and more liberal than the general public. Its survey of journalists found that at the bigger papers, 61% of newsroom respondents describe themselves as Democrats or leaning towards Democrat, and only 10% as Republicans or leaning towards Republican. Another survey found that in 92, 89% of Washington journalists surveyed 
voted for Bill Clinton and 7% for Bush. This is uh, George Bush, of course. Uh, this is actually an increase of liberals and a decrease in conservative affiliation uh, from a similar survey conducted over a decade earlier in the early 1980s. And other research has found similar patterns uh, with about 61% of journalists calling themselves liberal and about five, um, sorry, 9% conservative or conservative to moderate. Now, occasionally you have journalists who are going to admit this. Uh, in 2004, the New York Times public editor wrote a refreshingly frank column uh, saying just this. He was talking about social issues, uh, gay rights, gun control, abortion, environmental regulation. Quote, if you think the Times plays it down the middle on any of them, you've been reading the paper with your eyes closed. True. Uh, Hazlitt um, himself wrote about this kind of bias. Uh, he was talking about hostility to the idea of savings, but it works just as well in referring to hostility towards other free market ideas writ large. He said, quote, when once people have decided to deride a practice or an institution, any argument against it, no matter how illogical, is considered good enough. Now, my own experience working in DC as a political correspondent for over a decade indicates this is consistent with that premise. Uh, some of my previous jobs were working as a reporter in the Washington Bureau of Time, Inc., which publishes Time Magazine. Uh, the Washington Bureau for Wired Ventures, which at the time published uh, Wired Magazine, now it's owned by Condé Nast. I've written a short-lived column for UPI, a slightly longer-lived one for Business 2.0, and an even longer-lived one for George Magazine, the home of the media elite right there. Um, I've accompanied the president on Air Force One and have, when I lived in D.C., been a card-carrying member of the National Press Club. And during that time, in interactions with hundreds of my colleagues, uh, I found political reporters uh, to be consistently left of center and editors to be consistently, generally, the same way. Uh, the better ones uh, will go out of their way to correct for this bias, uh, but it's like any profession. Um, you have the mediocre people who will not or cannot. And so if we accept that the allegations of bias are true, we have to ask why they're true. Uh, to conclude that a mostly liberal media exists almost requires positing something like a a news cartel, which in turn requires things like collusion among existing members, limiting competition, and punishing defection. Uh, Daniel Sutter at the University of Oklahoma explored this topic in a 2001 paper and tried to answer whether the source of the bias comes from the demand side, that is the reader or consumer of news, or the supply side, and that is either the owners, editors, or journalists. Now he pointed out correctly that bias news runs the risk of alienating customers who have centrist or conservative views. I mean, think about it. Uh, why would the owners of a biased news organization tolerate that bias if they could maximize profits by appealing uh, to a larger audience that included underserved conservatives or libertarians? And we do know that it's possible for new entrants to join the traditional national media marketplace. So Fox News and USA Today are good examples of that, uh, but it's an expensive and risky proposition. USA Today lost $800 million in its first nine years of operation, and Fox News still lags behind CNN in terms of uh, unique viewers, even 11 years after its launch. In fact, from August 2005 to 2006, Fox News lost 7% of its total day viewers, while CNN and MSNBC gained 35% and 26% respectively. And so one de demand side explanation of bias is that news media consumers are more liberal than voters, and there in fact is some evidence to back that up. Uh, but the better expl explanation probably lies on the supply side with journalists themselves. Uh, there's a personal and often a professional cost in being an outlier among your colleagues during those water cooler conversations and annual salary reviews. Uh, surveys suggest the top tier journalism programs like Columbia University's Graduate Journalism School graduate a very liberal crop of students every year which implies that the most desirable new writers are probably going to be left of center. Uh, David Barron, who's a professor of political economy at Stanford University, offered what I think is an intriguing explanation. Uh, he said that a profit-maximizing news organization tolerates bias uh, if and only if, it allow, if, if that bias allows it to hire journalists at a lower wage. Now think about it. And so let's assume reporters and they are also qualified to work in public relations, technical writing, or ad sales. Mean reporter salaries are just over $40,000, according to the latest information, 2005, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But public relations, technical writing, and ad sales salaries are an average of nearly $13,000 higher. Uh, the mean disparity grows to over $30,000 when you compare editor's salaries 
basically editors or managers with those of public relations and advertising managers, $30,000 a year. Now, there are many reasons why journalists would probably take lower salaries, maybe the potential for travel or the publicity associated with bylines. But for many reporters, at least in my experience, um, they, they like the quasi-academic feel of being divorced from a for-profit organization. Um, but nevertheless, so just about all of them know that they could make more money elsewhere uh, if they wanted to switch jobs, sometimes even doubling their salaries in uh, large metro areas. Uh, and by the way, for anyone on the business faculty, if a college or university right in between those numbers, um, the average salary is 67500 uh, So the model I suggested so far is one with an industry of an industry with cartel-like aspects uh, that's his historically been marked by relatively high barriers to entry, at least on a national scale. On the supply side, reporters tend to be liberal and owners may tolerate this bias in exchange for paying lower salaries. But this model um, that has been in existence for decades now starts to crumble when barriers to, to entry are low, which brings us to the internet. Uh, we've already seen some instances of blogs raising topics that the mainstream media has been unwilling uh, to touch. Uh, by unearthing information, publicizing it aggressively, they've practically forced mainstream journalists to pay attention on occasion. Now, one of those happened in President Bush's re-election campaign in 2004 when CBS News ran a story raising the question of favoritism uh, during his time in the Texas Army National Guard. You don't have to see the, detail, um, the details, but basically this is, um, the, this is one of the documents that CBS News 60 Minutes claimed were authentic. Dan Rather claimed that they came from the late Colonel Killian's personal files and they had been authenticated by outside independent experts. Now, the segment aired two months before the November election and they uh, indicated, this and other documents indicated, that Bush disobeyed a direct order to appear for his physical. Other documents alleged that the Bush family friends intervened on his behalf. Hours after the story aired on 60 Minutes, conservative bloggers started assailing the documents and the credibility of the reporters. Uh, the discussion seems to have started on sites like Free Republic and Powerline and quickly spread outwards. Uh, some bloggers questioned the fonts used, uh, saying that it looked like the alleged original documents uh, had been created by a modern version of Microsoft Word rather than something typed in 1972. I mean, this is clearly not a typewriter. Uh, others questioned the terminology used. Uh, now, CBS and Dan Rather initially stood by the document's authenticity, but after about two weeks, they bowed to criticism from bloggers and other uh, other competitors that were essentially forced by bloggers to pick up the story, USA Today among them, and acknowledged uh, that the documents could not be authentic authenticated and no originals were actually available. Uh, CBS, president, uh, CBS News President Andrew Hayward would eventually say, based on what we know now, CBS News cannot prove that the documents are authentic, which is the only acceptable journalistic standard to justify using them in this report. We should not have used them. That was a mistake which we d deeply regret. Now, what made this incident even more embarrassing for CBS News is that the producer put her, her source of the documents in contact with John Kerry's presidential campaign, something that's not a neutral or even professional thing to do. That producer was fired. Senior news executives were asked to resign. Uh, what's worth noting is, is that political bloggers uh, tend to be overtly biased instead of covertly biased, and even proud of these biases, whether it's liberal, conservative, libertarian or other. I mean, certainly all of the most popular online writers and bloggers fall into this category. And my hunch is that it's a market response to the lack of media organizations, at least mainstream national ones, that are openly partisan. And even ones who, uh, that are in fact biased, uh, of course, claim not to be. And it's also a throwback to the earlier days of journalism. I mean, you can uh, pick up a book, it's called Debating the Issues in Colonial Newspapers. Um, and it's a compilation of original sources, hundreds of pages of uh, newspapers uh, that describe the partisan political debates that took place at that time in those pages. I mean, the Federalists had their network of weekly newspapers, uh, primarily in New England, but with a strong presence in Pennsylvania. Here's a, uh, an image from one of them. It's a pro-Federalist poster, circa 1800, with Washington urging support for pillars of federalism, Republican, and democracy. At Al Alexander Hamilton's urging, and with some of Hamilton's money, Noah Webster founded New York's first daily newspaper with a an unabashedly Federalist slant. Uh, both allies and enemies attributed Thomas Jefferson's eventual presidential victory in 1800 to newspapermen with anti-Federalist biases. And um, even so, uh, the Jeffersonians were outnumbered, with some estimates showing that Federalists were losing ground but still had a two-to-one numeric advantage 
in terms of newspapers controlled by the turn of the century. Uh, in other words, some corners of new media are just reverting back to that time-honored tradition of partisan reporting. If you wanted to have a balanced view of the news back then, you just read both the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist papers, and you didn't expect neutrality from one single source. So liberal bloggers have also had chances to take pot shots at politicians. I mean, when Senator Trent Lott spoke at Strom Thurmond's 100th birthday party, he said, when Strom Thurmond ran for president, we voted for him. Uh, we're, proud of it, we're proud of it, and if the rest of the country had followed our lead, we wouldn't have had all those problems over the years either. Now, Lott clearly was supporting the ideas uh, that Thurmond ran on as a Dixiecrat in 1948, but it's less clear what ideas he meant. It was Lott making a Federalist point about states' rights that uh, many of us here would agree is perfectly reasonable, or was it a thinly veiled racist remark? Well, liberal bloggers said it was the second, and uh, they kept the story alive. Eventually, the mainstream media returned to it. They just treated it as a gossip item initially. And after losing the report of support of some of his fellow Republicans and the White House, Lott resigned as Senate Majority Leader two weeks later. Now, it's not just bloggers doing end runs around print media, of course. I mean, recently, fast internet connections and cheaper digital and video cameras have let sites like YouTube and Flickr become household words. When John Kerry showed up at a campaign stop for uh, California gubernatorial uh, candidate Phil Angelides last October, Kerry said, if you make the most of education, you study hard, you do your homework, and you make an effort to be smart, you can do well. If you don't, you get stuck in Iraq. And that video quickly appeared on YouTube, and you all remember the rest. And then there's Representative John Sweeney, who found out that uh, the perils of having embarrassing moments like this one endlessly replayed online. And for him, it wasn't something that he said, it's something that he did. He showed up intoxicated at the Alpha Delta Phi fraternity at upstate New York's Union College. One of the students had a camera phone. You can see a second one uh, aiming a phone right there in the bottom right. Um, the incriminating photographs hit the net, and Sweeney lost his re-election bid. Um, correlation or causation? I don't know, but it certainly didn't help. <laughs> Uh, there's Senator Ted Stevens, um, a Republican, had much the same treatment, but with a twist. Let's see if we can actually hear this. Anyone remember the Tubes video? Maybe it's, maybe it's not playing. Um, uh, see, Stevens at the time was the chairman of uh, the uh, Senate Commerce Committee, which is uh, charged with a hopeless task of writing laws to regulate the Internet. I mean, we may not agree with that, but we could probably agree that internet legislators should at least have a modicum of understanding of the medium they're trying to regulate. Um, unfortunately, Stevens did not. Uh, he, he, he said the internet is not a dump truck, which probably is reasonable, but he did, his metaphor didn't really take him much further beyond that. Um, and so uh, this was quickly picked up on YouTube, on Comedy Central's uh, The Daily Show, and on a techno remix that I tried to play but failed uh, to do. Uh, w w once your comments make it into a techno remix, you know that there's not much further down you can go. <laughs> and then there's uh, Senator George Allen's uh, in his macaca uh, racial slur which also is probably not going to cooperate. Okay, uh, uh, this, this was caught on YouTube. Uh, he made an ethnic slur at a campaign rally. It was caught on video camera. He was talking about representatives of the opposing campaign that were there, and he lost re-election. Uh, now, what's interesting is this sort of YouTube and blogging and Wikipedia, MySpace, etc. revolution is an emergence of free market websites that can propel us beyond this traditional left-right axis. I mean, I'm thinking of sources of commentary, news information, Mises.org, rationalreview.com, downsizedc.com, antiwar.com, and probably dozens or hundreds of others that I don't even know about, um, but certainly could not have existed without, without the internet. These sites also uh, represent our best chance of challenging uh, the pro-power bias in the mainstream media. I'm not aware of any research that's quali quantified this, and I'm probably not even expressing it very eloquently, um, but it's my impression is that both liberal and conservative journalists tend to be pro-government power and therefore pro-government expansion for entirely predictable reasons. Uh, think, let's think of them. Uh, quoting government statistics is easier than having to do the research yourself. They're also free. Private organizations may charge for them. Government officials are always ready to assist in news coverage that's expected to be favorable, sometimes much more so than private organizations, especially startups that just don't have uh, the manpower and have to tend to their bottom line. If you're in Washington, you're a political reporter who lives in Washington, your friends and the parents of your children's friends, your social network, in other words, is made up of government officials, 
party hacks, and like-minded folks. Uh, covering power can be lucrative. If you're a, a reporter in a state house, you're covering an obscure politician, and that politician ends up, ends up on the presidential campaign trail, and you get a six-figure advance. Uh, it can pay off in other ways. Uh, journalists landing civil service jobs for life, uh, becoming lobbyists for trade groups. Um, at the most basic level, if your job is to cover the federal government and the federal government begins to shrink, you just may not have a job anymore. Uh, so these are just a few of the temptations that the mainstream media has uh, that the YouTube the blogging revolutionaries do not. And, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and so uh, l let's hope that as the internet grows, as technology advances, as more people find it easier to do things online, uh, let the internet give birth to many more uh, Henry Hazlitts. Thank you very much. We'll have any questions now. Look, the, the whole issue of why the media is sort of left wing, uh, the two economists named uh, Michael Jensen and Bill Meckling wrote about this about 20 years ago or so. They were from the University of Rochester. And uh, well, one part of their theory was that if you're a journalist, uh, most of the news you cover is government information, comes from the government, so, as you just uh, sort of talked about. So that um, if you don't treat government in a positive way, you risk being cut off from that information flow, and your career is ruined. And so, uh, and so that was, I think that was their main theme of why uh, the media is so biased, that um, the information flow from government, uh, and maybe it wasn't like that 50 or 75 years ago or 100 years ago. That, you know, a friend of mine who just moved from Canada told me that uh, one of the big differences she noticed is that almost all the national news in America is always politics. Whereas in Canada, at least a lot of it was about life. It wasn't about politics. <laughs> so if you watch the evening news, it's nothing but politics. And so if you're a journalist, uh, you have to be left wing. I have a bias in that direction. So uh, yeah, the, the question is to repeat it for um, the online audience. Uh, uh, there's, there's evidence uh, to research at the University of Rochester um, who said that journalists are uh, essentially pro large government because so much news comes from the government and if you uh, right things are too critical, you cut off your sources. And that's, of course, entirely true. Uh, the better news organizations will have a good cop and a bad cop. There'll be the good cop reporter who shows up at the press conferences at the Department of Commerce or the Department of State or whatnot, uh, it writes uh, the nice flattering article, and then you'll have the bad cop reporter who does the digging, writes the investigative pieces that make uh, the government look like idiots. Uh, and, if you're, and, and, and because PR people in government tend not to be <laughs> that aware. They, they may still keep talking to the good cop reporter, and generally do, um, thinking that it's more of a personal, personal thing rather than an organizational or institutional thing. But you, you're right. Uh, if, you, if you piss off your sources, uh, you tend to lose uh, uh, information in the future. You're, you're certainly not going to get exclusive access or the interview with a senior official that could advance your career. Uh, yes? I want to add to what Paul said. Most news in Canada is about hockey. <laughs> here, here. Uh, What's wrong with that? <laughs> uh, I have a suggestion for you to add in your repertoire of these examples, and that's this guy, I forget his name, someone can help me here, who wrote about gun control in the uh, early part of our uh, country. He won, uh, he was an Emory professor, and he won all sorts of prizes for his book. Uh, we had no culture of guns. And then there was a whole bunch of bloggers that uh, kept uh, extendoing, saying, you know, we're trying to check out this source, we couldn't find it, we're trying to check out that source. We must add this the next time we do that speech. I also wanted to add uh, another hypothesis to Tom's uh, as to why journalists might be biased toward the left or biased against the market, and that is because they're intellectuals. This one comes from a lot of music and other Intellectuals are the people in high school who got great marks. And then they see somebody like uh, you know, the uh, pizza guy or the uh, burger guy making a lot more money than they're making, and they think that capitalism is unfair. So to the extent that they share in this general bias of all intellectuals against the market, this might account for some of that as well. Uh, the, the, the question was, it was or, uh, two parts. First was uh, there's uh, the 
the book, I, I have a copy of it um, uh, by the Emory, Emory Fellow saying that there's no gun culture. It was given to me by the head of a Washington, D.C. <laughs> liberal advocacy, advocacy group who said, read this and learn something. Um, <laughs> but there's, uh, and the, the other point is, is an excellent one, which was um, the journalists are bi biased because they tend to be intellectuals. Uh, they see uh, people who are high school dropouts making much more money as entrepreneurs. Um, uh, and I, I think that's right. It's even worse in business and politics to some, uh, um, to some extent uh, because business reporters are covering people who are making insanely more than the reporters. The reporters get jealous. Um, uh, there's uh, politics. It's probably ju just as much. You see these um, not so smart, uh, lying, conniving politicians who then turn around and become lobbyists at mid-six-figure salaries. And you, um, uh, well, anyway, uh, there's, uh, okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, in the far back, uh, yes, you. Do you think the old media can survive today's The question is, can old media survive in today's world? I mean, this, um, uh, yeah, yes and no. I'm going to hedge, hedge the question a little. I mean, th th this, is a, this is a huge topic of conversation in journalism uh, circles. Uh, sites like pointer.org, P-O-I-N-T-E-R. Uh, endless discussions about are newspapers dead? I mean, certainly circulation hasn't been doing very well. Uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, there's, uh, there's more advertising going, going online. I mean, my employer, CNET Networks in San Francisco, is benefiting from that. So you have uh, circulation dropping, advertising moving online. This is not a great position to be in if you're in the newspaper biz. Most of the people I know who work at newspapers are uh, thinking of exit strategies or at least contemplating them in the back of their mind. Uh, that, um, and so I, I'm not sure if newspapers are going to be around as we know them today in 20 years. Uh, but is, is the mainstream media going to be around? Probably. I mean, even, um, even after you have these millions and millions of blogs being created, uh, you still don't have a substantial number of people who use them as a daily news source. Um, uh, under um, less than 10 percent, according to, I think that was Pew Research uh, stats. And so if you don't have that many people who are using, using them as info sources, then I think uh, uh, the mainstream media is going to exist for a while. Uh, one thing that might help are, site, um, are services like iTunes that sort of break the broadcast stranglehold. Now you can subscribe to uh, broadcast television uh, that is produced by someone with a much lower budget uh, but looks just as good or almost as good as the nightly newscast and maybe with a, a, a less uh, free market anta antagonism bias. Um, another question in the back. Yes. Yeah, um, I've been involved. I will say that, that uh, we bloggers have depended on the news media to sort of get some information out there. Now, what happened was that the mainstream media all decided at the beginning that these guys were guilty. And uh, it's really been interesting because um, uh, I started writing on it, and I started hearing, hearing like, you know, I've got a mole with the New York Times telling me about, oh, yeah, this reporter really screwed up on this story, so we had to finally take them off it and put somebody else on there. And so it was, it was interesting to see what happened in, in, in that the blogs actually have had an effect upon the mainstream coverage. I, I tell people that, you know, last May there were, you know, really you had, uh, there's about four of us writing on the case, and it was us against the New York Times and, uh, all the other mainstream media, and the, uh, as well as the judicial system of, of the state of North Carolina, which is you know, something akin to what Stalin had. And, uh, and I tell people, these, those really weren't very fair odds, because the, the, you know, the person who <laughs> were writing could always outthink the New York Times report. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it's, but, there, but that being said, there is a demand out for somebody to get information that the bloggers just, I mean, we don't have the, the wherewithal to get information like that. I mean, that I, I still, you know, I'll, you know, following this case, I'll pick up the Raleigh News and Observer. They had a, a uh, what, what ultimately happened was, uh, in this particular case, I, I like to the, the adults took over. And so Joe Neff, who is a very, very good investigative reporter, finally, he got in, into it, and when he got into it, it game over. You know, the idiots uh, there at the NMO uh, all took a back seat. So, and, you know, in, in short, I, I agree with you. There is a market. It's hard to know exactly how it's going to, to go. The one thing is that we are no, no longer are we going to have to depend on getting a, you know, a piece of paper to tell us what happened the day before because we already know what happened. 
thanks to the internet or whatever, it, uh, that, that uh, um, the form will be different. But it seems to me that these organizations in which people actually get information, there's going to be demand for it. Could you repeat that, Bill? <laughs> 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 oh, let, let me try to summarize. Um, some, some bloggers covered the Duke lacrosse case and found, a, found that their coverage had, had an impact, but at the same time, the mainstream media was valuable for the sort of focus coverage that they can provide, which, which, is, which is true. I mean, th this is the standard response by journalists, and, uh, by journalists uh, and editors. You're not going to have bloggers you know, packing up and moving to Afghanistan or Iraq uh, to, co to cover what happens there. They're not going to be able to, to take off two months of their life and cover a high-profile trial. Oh, yeah, they might be able to drop in on a lark, but uh, so, some events do not lend themselves to blogging. But, you know, court documents, original things, that, especially anything you can find on the Internet, it lends itself to um, red, readily available blogging. If it requires some digging, requires lots of telephone calls, lots of in-person visits, uh, yeah, that, that's not going to happen for, for a while until we get some very good micropayment uh, system set up. Click here, spend 20 cents to read an article, um, and then... Uh, and, and then the journalist can get presumably paid that way. It ha hasn't happened yet. Maybe it never will. I've been predicting it for a while. And I've been wrong every every time. Uh, yes, sir. Well, we all of us, I think, basically, uh, pretty well aware about the, the concept of market failure by mainstream economics. And uh, the idea is that if the, if the private sector cannot turn out something in big quantities, then the government should step in. And like we don't have enough left-wing propaganda, and you painted quite a bleak picture of that, <laughs> Uh, we have a NPR and PBS turning the same kind of thing on our behalf and using government taxes. So do you think that the subsidy that's practically a left subsidy of left-wing views affected the whole market? It's just kind of like a supply-side economics is its worse. I mean, the supply creates its own demand. I mean, if, if we have NPR, which monopolized kind of, I would say, um, intellectualism on the, on the radio waves or PBS on the TV, uh, then, then uh, does it move the whole market to the left? I, I haven't thought about it phrased in those ways. The question is, does the existence of NPR and PBS move the entire market to the left? Uh, I, su I suspect you're, you're right. If you, wa um, if you want to, um, um, I mean, N NPR and PBS are large operations. They've got studios all over the place. Uh, uh, the, these are multi-billion dollar operations. And so if you wanted to compete with them and have a uh, free market or even like remotely uh, libertarian conservative talk radio, um, you're, you're going to have a very difficult time doing that. And also because NPR breeds a lot of journalists uh, uh, and PBS breed, breeds a lot of journalists, then you tend to have um, them, um, that supply that you mentioned. And it probably does move things to the left, but I haven't actually thought about it um, bef before now. Uh, yes, sir, in the front. I got a question all these charges of mainstream media being left-wing propaganda, given that under the last six years of the Bush administration, they've been entirely reactionary, being manipulated by Carl Rove, and just going along with the bald-faced lies that have been put out there in front of the American people. So the question is, are, are journalists really liberal when they've gone along with the Bush administration and have been insufficiently aggressive in covering it? Uh, well, I mean, some of us have been aggressive in covering the Bush administration. I have been um, uh, as, as, since uh, 2001. Uh, but, ha but the question is, has everyone else? I mean, if you, m maybe this goes to, to, to the last thing I mentioned, which is reporters have uh, this love for power and to get close to power, and power in Washington <laughs> is measured by your prox proximity to the presidency, uh, and, that, and anything you can do uh, to move that along is, is going to, to help you, your status in many ways. Uh, that's that's probably the best offer I can uh, or answer I can offer. It's not like re reporters are now instead of 90% Democrat uh, registered and voting, 90% Republican registered and voting. It could be um, a, uh, it could be overcompensation. Liberals don't want to be viewed as soft on terror, uh, much like the Democrats uh, also lost their spine for many many years. Uh, so it's it's, pro it's probably some combination of sucking up to power versus um, not looking uh, uh, versus versus the terror thing. I don't have a great answer for you. Uh, yes, in the sweater. Just a comment on that. I would say that uh, the Bush administration is uh, big government socialist team A, and then you have big government socialist team B, which might be the Democrats and Terry. <laughs> and as long as you have uh, journalists covering this team A, team B thing, as long as it's bigger government, more government control, and internationalism, I think they're all happy. My question is, do you think that the powers that be, the elite that you're talking about here, will uh, 
restrict internet, <coughs> that they will constrict the freedom of this, and are they truly threatened by it because <coughs> Americans are naturally anti-establishment and kind of adventurous people? Do they find a real threat here, and are they going to go after it as a thing? Have a you made two points. The first was the, um, a better response than I gave, which, which was that you know, Bush is big government anyway. No child left behind is hardly um, a, a very uh, a federalist uh, type of thing to do. And the second is, will, will, the, go um, will the government restrict the internet? I, I've been writing with that topic f um, uh, since 1996, uh, actually even earlier. I was one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit against the Communications Decency Act. Um, we, um, we sued Janet Reno and won 9-0 before the Supreme Court, which is always kind of fun. Uh, there's uh, early on, the danger was greater uh, because not as many people knew about the internet. There weren't as many alternative news sources on the internet. Uh, there have been a bunch of censorship laws. The Communications Decency Act, which punished um, four-letter word usage online, uh, was one of them. Uh, the Child Online, Online Protection Act of 1998 followed that. It's still in litigation. It went up to the Supreme Court, um, court once. It went back down. Uh, it's, it's, it's now, we're now awaiting a decision from a district court and, uh, judge in Philadelphia. Uh, that's on the free speech front. On the privacy front, there, there have been a bunch of, I mean, this is the le le liberal view of privacy, which is uh, data collection and retention regulations aimed at, at for-profit businesses. Uh, and th those have been enacted, um, but not as broad as it could be. Spyware um, regulations, not as broad as it could be. Uh, the, the best example is uh, the Federal Election Commission attempt to regulate bloggers. And that came down about a year, year or two ago. Uh, I interviewed um, uh, Brad Smith, who is uh, the, uh, at that time a libertarian leading FEC commissioner, and uh, he essentially blew the whistle through my article on what the FEC was going to do in terms of regulating and registering bloggers. Uh, with, after that happened, uh, the FEC backed down. They said, oh, no, of course we don't want to do this, even though the, it was a deadlock three to three, uh, Republican versus Democrat. The Republicans needed a majority to appeal their loss some. Um, uh, in court, um, saying that the regs were unconstitutional. Um, the, de the, the bottom line is that the Democrats have backed down really quickly um, because they didn't want to alienate their blogger base, and that got, sh and that, and that got shot down. Um, about 90% of, of the teeth in the regulation uh, fell, out, fell out. That's the best example, um, but it's, it's probably going to um, hap uh, happen again. It's, it's, uh, this is government, and this is what regulators do. <laughs> A related yes. question on the broadcast side involves possibly a sort of fairness doctrine. Are you picking up anything there concerning uh, either legislative efforts in that regard, uh, DNC efforts in that regard, or perhaps uh, efforts on the part of what some refer to as a dinosaur media? Uh, the question is, is the fairness doctrine going to re rear its ugly head again? Uh, I don't write about broadcast stuff, and so I don't actually follow this. Uh, there, have been, there has been some talk among Democrats at reviving it um, in terms of, uh, d this is more heated um, conversations and serious policy proposals, but that has been talked about. Uh, I, it has not been talked about in the context of the internet as far as I know, and that would be a pretty big step for them to try to make. Yes, sir. Um, YouTube is currently facing potential lawsuits for a number of media broadcast companies to return on news organizations. Uh, there's uh, the question is uh, you, the, the Viacom lawsuit that it filed this week against YouTube for a, a billion dollars and a permanent injunction uh, is that is that a way for the old media to restrain the new? Uh, I mean, copyright and, and intellectual property in, in these circles is sort of divisive, um, and I have mixed views myself. My reading um, is that it's clearly um, unlawful uh, for um, for people, individuals on YouTube to post content outside of uh, the um, fair use, uh, the, the, outside of the scope of what fair use permits. Um, the question is, uh, can there be contributory or vicarious liability attaching to uh, YouTube for this? Um, the Supreme Court said in the, in the Grokster case that, um, that Grokster could uh, uh, be held liable for what its users do, but Gro Grokster, this is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sharing uh, or file sharing case, Grokster's executives were really sort of egging it on and YouTube's been much more, well, of course we don't want any of that infringing content to appear on YouTube. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a much harder case uh, for Viacom to win. Overall, 
Uh, probably, um, but at the same, um, uh, th th this, this would be a way, but on, on the flip side, all these large uh, media conglomerates, um, including CBS, uh, have, have started licensing stuff to YouTube, and so I, I think in the end it's just a business dispute that, that's playing out in the courts, and if uh, Viacom um, and YouTube get, get, reach the magic number, that loss is going away tomorrow. Other questions? Yes. Do you have any thoughts on Roger Ailes and Murdoch's efforts to start a new business channel? I was particularly taken by Murdoch's comment that the existing financial news channel is anti-business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the question is, um, uh, Murdoch's uh, plans uh, or uh, proposals for a new business channel. Um, I, I don't really follow broadcast media that um, that carefully, and so I, I haven't paid close attention beyond the same things that you've probably read. Uh, it, it is odd that a lot of uh, what we call financial journalism nowadays is, is not a very uh, pro-market. Um, even journalists for the Wall Street Journal, not the editorial page, but for uh, the front page, are somewhat hostile to free market ideas, which uh, when I was a, a, a young and uh, a somewhat naive reporter uh, in DC surprised me immensely when I ran into them um, at, a, at a party um, one evening. Uh, how could you, you write for the Wall Street Journal? How would you? Anyway. Uh, so. <laughs> so and, and, and so I, I think that, that, that such a thing could, could probably survive. It could be the Forbes versus the fortune of the broadcast media uh, sector, but I, I, don't, I haven't followed it more closely than that. Other questions? I think we're finished, folks. Thank you very much.